So the open systems interconnection model, uh, like stated, it's a reference model that describes how information from a software application like say a web browser that's open on your computer. So it could be a web browser or it could be your online um, conferencing application like say Skype or it could be Zoom or it could be also considered as uh, you know any anything else that runs on your computer uh, that needs access to another application sitting remotely on a different computer right so uh, for simplicity sake let's assume uh, a web browser uh, which you open up to say uh, get access to web page uh, say amazon.com so you open up the browser type amazon.com and what you're able to, you would be able to see is if you have an internet connection the amazon page would load on your browser as a result of uh, the files arriving to your computer from Amazon's web server which is kept somewhere remote which is actually present uh, somewhere remotely not at the same physical location as your uh, computer is right so basically that's what is happening um, when you open up any portal on your web browser so it connects to the browser using a protocols to be more specific uh, using protocols like hypertext transport protocol HTTP or HTTPS, uh, which is a secure version of HTTP, to load the files from a web server which is remote into uh, the web browser of, I mean, into your PC and displaying it through the web browser. All right, so. Uh, those are just stories at high level which uh, can help you relate to how uh, I mean what is the, the the high level thing about how do you connect to any remote device isn't it in a day-to-day -day basis um, imagine about accessing this video content through the flip Academy portal right so when you do that uh, what is happening is this video content that is stored in the um, file server of um, Flipped Academy, it's being streamed and displayed at your end through a browser in your PC, you know, um, while the data is being transmitted all across from the, the VM where the data is being loaded to your PC which is sitting next to you right so there, there's some journey that the data is taking up so how does that happen and how does uh, you know the devices sitting in between operate in a way that it it, it it is totally seamless you know so for all of these devices sitting in between to communicate in a language that they understand in a way they can seamlessly um, you know share information that they receive and so forth there are a lot of protocols that run in between there are a lot of standards that are in place to ensure that these sort of communications happen in a seamless manner so OSI model or the open systems interconnection model is something that describes the specification or the standard practices that need to be followed in order to achieve all of these communication in a world of internet right so starting off with the uh, the uh, the seven uh, the seven layer architecture of osi model uh, let's list down these in a uh, numerical order so physical layer basically referred to as layer 1 of OSI model, data link layer referred to as layer 2, network layer as layer 3, transport layer as layer 4, session layer as layer 5, presentation as layer 6 and finally application as layer 7. 
So let's start with application layer. Let's take a top down approach here to understand what is happening at each layer. So let us take the same example of having a browser open on in your computer. And in the browser, you type, say, flipped, flipped dot Gaius networks. Oops, it went a bit beyond the browser. Sorry, that's a space constraint, so I write it this way. So when we are doing this, when we are typing flip.guysnetworks.com, in the back end, what is happening is your PC would try to do a domain name translation to understand, or domain name resolution rather, to understand what is the IP address corresponding to this. And after that domain name resolution is done, which is uh, done using sending a query to the DNS server, domain name service so server will ask who is flip.guysnetworks.com and the DNS server would reply back saying that flip.guysnetworks.com is say 100.001. I'm just taking a random IP address, right? That might not be the case. So let's assume that it's the reply is 100.001. Now, what should the PC do? PC looks into it now through the browser. It has said that okay, I want to connect to this using HTTP now, as a protocol HTTP or HTTPS if it is a secure one. So when that happens, um, the the PC in the back end tries to connect to this 100.001 IP address and from the web server it tries to load what is there in the index page of this. Uh, those files back to the browser are loaded using HTTP or HTTP as whatever the appropriate protocol be. Uh, so while all of these are happening, that's it's a long term to say that, okay, the file transfer is happening. But at application layer, all that we can define is that it is something that gives the network process to the application. So basically defining the type of protocol to be used whether it be HTTP or HTTPS you know or, and that's the case of uh, opening up a web page but otherwise if you are say doing a domain name uh, query so you use the protocol called DNS all of these are layer 7, seven protocols HTTP, HTTPS, DNS and there are a big, big bunch out there you have like simple mail transfer protocol SMTP, you have file transfer protocol and so forth. So basically layer 7, it deals with the network process to application. Now uh, at layer 6, that is presentation layer, that's where it deals with uh, data representation and encryption. What I mean by that is like encoding uh, of data, encoding and decoding. Now at the source end, now let us take this as source which is your PC where you have the browser open and the destination being uh, the, the web server where you have uh, flipped academies web page source files right so you have type flip.guysnetworks.com through DNS query you know you got the IP address and the PC uh, what it does is it sends out an HTTP query so now I'm not getting into the get post methods within HTTP, but the whole point is what would happen in this case when you do this open this uh, URL is uh, it would attempt uh, opening up or loading the files from the web server into your uh, machine. It, 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 it will bring all of those here, you know, and at, at the presentation layer, it's basically trying to represent the data, right? Uh, the Flipped Academy page, flipped.gasnetworks.com would have uh, certain images, uh, you know, along with image there would be some text, there could also be possibly uh, recorded um, or uh, audio files that you can open by just clicking it, you know. So uh, all of these that would be generally represented as an say, HTML page, so loading that and getting that uh, page in the format like uh, or the content within it which has um, you know uh, 
picture in the form of JPEG format or say um, you know audio files in the format of MP3 or uh, you know the whole uh, web page itself in the format of uh, HTML uh, page or rather if you have a, a document uh, that is listed there which you which could be directly opened it could be like say in dot doc or docx format whatever it is so basically the raw data which is basically in an uh, encoded format uh, for them to load and um, you know decode it and show it it's all the job of presentation layer so at the destination end what is happening is the presentation layer is responsible for i'm talking about the layer 6 it is responsible for com converting the raw files which we had that the raw file that we have it it would come convert that into what into an encoded format it will encode it and represent it in say dot uh, html dot uh, and and uh, within the dot html file you would have re references to various image files which would further link to you know dot jpeg or uh, if it is a video you can have say dot mpg mpeg or uh, you could have files uh, multimedia files with wma windows media audio and so forth so whatever it be that encoding and uh, you know converting into a format that can be transmitted across uh, you know uh, depending on the underlying protocol is being done at presentation layer and at the same uh, time when it reaches the other end uh, presentation layer is responsible for decoding it whatever got encoded at the other end decode it here and show it to the end user which is you who have opened flip.gasnetworks.com in the format you are supposed to see so presentation layer as discussed is responsible for data representation and uh, encryption basically wherever applicable and then there is this session layer session layer is something that deals with uh, starting session ending session and keeping them separate so what i mean by that is say you open up a browser uh, uh, you know you have opened up tip.guysnetwork.com or say uh, you have opened up gmail.com you open up another tab you open up uh, in that uh, microsoft.com or say msn.com now what you have opened on one tab right it does not get mixed with whatever is opened in another tab the the uh, within the same browser having different tabs or different windows which open up to various uh, different um, you know uh, open up various links to different web servers they send and receive traffic uh, in a way that it, it does not get mixed up with the different sessions that are created right so when you open up a browser and type in a url and press enter system tries to build a session with the destination server right so uh, starting a session and when you close the browser the session with the destination is also closed right so starting a session terminating a session or rather closing a session as well as keeping the sessions separate so when you have multiple tabs or windows open keeping the sessions distinct and different is also the task of the session layer so session establishment uh, tearing it down and keeping them separate um, specifically to say like uh, session establishment that is required in um, like say uh, in TCP in transmission control protocol which we will see that it's a layer 4 uh, protocol transport layer protocol but for it to establish a session you know uh, and like and keeping track of it being different in different uh, you know applications all of these are done by the session layers again uh, you could have a session initiation protocol done when you do and say an IP call and so forth so uh, likewise a real-time transmission uh, protocol like RTP and stuff, real-time transfer protocol. So, in all of these cases, keeping them, uh, starting them, uh, ending them, and keeping them separate, it's the task of session layer. 
Now, transport layer is responsible for, let us take the same example of uh, having the browser open in my PC and uh, in the browser I would have typed like flip.guysnetworks.com so I have opened flip website uh, da, 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 and it's connecting to the flip web server which is kept somewhere far which is far so separated by some van cloud so I'm showing the internet cloud here uh, which separates my PC which is located at my um, you know room uh, and it's connecting to the web server which is on cloud which is far say far by several miles so from the pc the connection would go to multiple devices in between you know, and finally it would reach the web server but uh, though we have that underlying network over that what is happening is we are establishing a session between these two virtually and between them we are able to communicate so um, in a transport layer is where we set up a reliable or unreliable mode of communication so in a case like where in this uh, case we are going with that http connection right http so whether it be http or https these both are tcp protocols right why we say so is uh, http or https which are application layer protocols they run over tcp at transport layer so here at uh, transport layer it would be tcp and over that we will have http or https running at a layer above it okay so we'll discuss further on uh, how does it get impacted uh, so transmission control protocol or TCP uh, that is a transport layer protocol, right? So it ensures reliability between the connection established here. So my PC where I have opened up the browser and I have typed the URL of the web server where it is in the back end it has uh, found the IP address to which I need to connect. So we had assumed that let it be like 100.001. In this case it will connect to 100.001 and uh, have a, a you know, reliable uh, connection established, host to host connection established. And uh, the reliability is established here in this case initially by setting up or doing a three-way handshake. So we'll see how the three-way handshake happens at a later point, but for now just understand that uh, so uh, there's a you know level connection established in this place now if I had to simply say uh, open up uh, Skype on my uh, PC so say I uh, do open Skype the purpose of installing and opening Skype is that so that I could communicate with somebody over internet who is far away who is connected to PC uh, from a remote location right PC or say mobile phone where they have the Skype application installed so, uh, in this case, the communication that has to happen between both, if you look at the way that is supposed to happen, uh, it's it's not uh, reliable. What do you mean by that is, here the priority is transmission of uh, the data between back and forth these two applications in the best effort possible. Here the uh, requirement is best effort delivery. We need to teach. In the sense, um, imagine all of these real-time communications that we do. If I am speaking something and you are listening to it, and the vice versa of it, that is you speak and I listen to it, uh, in such communications, we can't uh, expect to have a lot of latency, which will make um, the, this sort of communication a disaster. Um, here, what we expect is, the speed but at the same time uh, what if due to network issue some sort of um, you know hiccups in between network error or a component not working properly you might have packet drops if, if say uh, there is a two second drop of network you have no connectivity in between 
you lost internet now while the network connectivity comes back do you think whatever was lost will be retransmitted no which means 100% data delivery is not guaranteed in case of uh, unreliable sort of communication so that's what happens when you are doing uh, real time communication generally in real time communications 100% uh, traffic being delivered is not guaranteed and that's not a requirement there the requirement is the delivery should be as much fast as possible it should be the best effort delivery and that's it but in case of uh, communication where it needs to be reliable imagine about uh, you know opening up an email somebody send you an email when you open up your email client and say within that email client say outlook or thunderbird or whatever it is called say you open up gmail uh, within a browser so in the inbox if you see an email has come you open it you would want 100% data in it you can't have like uh, you have 50% data 50% is blurred out i mean it, it did not arrive because of a network issue no you you can never accept a communication of that sort when you're going with uh, this mode of communication so here you expect 100% data to be delivered from whoever has sent it so whoever has sent it that goes to the um, email server and it's it's loaded there so when you open up a client you you happen to see the content of what you have in the email server right so uh, you need 100% data in that case it's not best effort delivery that you are looking at speed does not matter even if it is uh, having a lag there is a bit uh, slowness in the way you receive their data that's fine it's acceptable but you want 100% data to come in but in real time streaming it's okay if if you have a a packet drop there's a lot of uh, i mean uh, if there's an issue in the network because of which there is some loss of traffic you can simply ignore it and continue with what is coming in future so retransmission does not happen but in a reliable mode of network, if there is um, a drop of packet or drop of some data that happens in between, uh, it will retransmit what was lost in the process of that transmission. That's the beauty of a reliable network. So we got, uh, to ensure reliability, what happens in TCP, especially the transmission control protocol, is that for every datagram that is sent or every uh, you know segment that is sent you would receive an acknowledgement back so it totally relies on acknowledgement to ensure that 100% data is transmitted uh, when we use TCP right so yeah that's that's the reason why we were talking about uh, why HTTPS goes by the TCP mode the reason being when you open a website or uh, portal using HTTP or HTTPS, you would want 100% of traffic uh, to land in from the destination, from wherever you are pulling it into your web browser or into your system. So that's ensured by this cost to cost protocol called TCP. So end to end connection, or you could also say host to host connectivity. This is ensured by uh, the transport layer. Okay. So two key protocols to know here is TCP and UDP, User Datagram Protocol, which is an unreliable way of doing it. And the next being uh, network layer, which is called the layer three protocol. Uh, layer three uh, a name, which is network layer, which is responsible for path determination and logical addressing so the popular protocol which you could have already heard of is internet protocol ip that functions in layer 3 so there are protocols like ip ipx kind of obsolete apple talk these are all layer 3 protocols right uh, even icmp but at the moment 
let's focus on IP internet protocol so IP addressing uh, is a logical addressing methodology right why logical addressing we had had this discussion in the uh, session one of network fundamentals where we discussed that any PC or any device that tries to communicate on a network or internet uh, or a LAN even then you would need the PC to be configured with a logical address logical address is what defines uh, in what network is the device sitting you know it's pretty much configurable you can um, configure it in a static way or you can do it dynamically using DHCP so for the details to what DHCP does and all those things we will deal with later but for now understand the logical addressing scheme especially at this moment we will talk about the IP version 4 which is a 32-bit address right it's a 32-bit address format and this 32-bit address is what uh, identifies a device on a network from another so the combination of this 32 bit has to be unique across and there should be a part of this 32 bits which stays common for all the devices belonging to a single network okay let us understand what you mean by that so sticking to a whiteboard so imagine about uh, a network where we have say let me take a uh, few devices connected using a switch let me up a LAN here now here for these devices to communicate with each other this is a switch uh, like I said they should belong to the same network because switch is a device that helps in communicating uh, you know between devices belonging to the same network now belonging to same network I have been repeating a couple of times so what do you mean by that so in the IP address that we configure right the logical address this total 32 bits a part of it which has which is called as the network bits network bits and host bits those are the two parts Let me write it in full so you have this network bits and there is this host bits host bits together called host id and network bits all together called as network id now if network id is a 24 bits you guess it right the remaining 8 bits of the 32 bit ip address are host bits so uh, what defines or what says that in a given ip address so let's assume that there is an ip address of 192.168 or rather let me take a simple example simpler one uh, let me take 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot uh, 1 assigned to this PC okay this is 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot 1 this is 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot 2 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot say 5 so in this case uh, 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot 1 uh, say slash 24 what this slash 24 means is the first 24 bits in the given IP address we know that this IP address which is a 32 bit address uh, which is an IPv4 address point to be noted is represented in dotted decimal format which means all of these that I mentioned here these are all decimal values 10 is a decimal value the next 10 is a decimal value next 10 is a decimal value and 1 is a decimal value and uh, each of these separated by a dot so how many bit value is this this is in fact an 8 bit value so 8 bits which is called an octet right so in a given 32 bit IP address there would be 4 octets there will be 4 octets right so 4 8 bit values 4 into 8 32 so this is an 8 bit value 8 bit value this is an 8 bit value and this is an 8 bit value so let's represent this in binary format the decimal number 10 like i told you these are all decimal values because this is a decimal representation it's it's not 1 0 in binary it's 10 itself decimal 10 so decimal 10 in binaries uh, is 1010 right 
So for those who don't know how to do a conversion from SML to binary, see this is how you do it. So let's take another example. Not let's not take 10 initially. Let's take example of say uh, 25. So if you had to convert 25 into um, binaries, what you would do is take the LCM approach, right? Divide by two. So how many times does it go? It goes like uh, 12 times. And the remind, what is the remainder? Remainder is one, right? Again, by two it goes six times. When it does six times, the remainder is zero. Next, let's again do it by two. It goes three times. Three into two is six, so remainder is zero. Next, again it is divisible. One time. So when I when it goes one time, the remainder is one. Now read it reverse, which is 11001. 11001 is the binary of the decimal value 25. Now, how do we convert any binary number back to decimal? Let's also see that. So 11001, if you had to convert back to decimal, you would have to do this method. Let's say 2 power 0, 2 power 1, 2 power 2. 2 power 3 and 2 power 4. 2 power 0 into 1, which is 2 power 0 is 1, 1 into 1 is 1. 2 power 1 is 2, 2 into 0 is 0. We have to add this basically. Plus 2 power 2 is 4, 4 into 0 is 0. Plus 2 power 3 is 8, 8 into 1 is 8. Plus 2 power 4 is 16. 16 into 1 is 16. So 16 plus 8 plus 1, which is 25. See, that's how you convert back from binary to decimal. But overall, the point was to, I want to show you how do you write uh, this given IP address 10.10.10.1 10 10 in binary. So now, 10, the binary of 10 is 1010. 0, 0. If you want, you can convert it to see that. 2 power 0, 2 power 1, 2 power 2, 2 power 3. So 2 power 0 into 0, Any anything multiplied by 0 is 0. 2 power 1 into 1 is 2. 2 power 2 into 0, 0. 2 power 3 into 1. What is 2 power 3? 8 into 1, 8. So what is 8 plus 2? 10. So that validates it. So we have 10.10.10.1. Now 10.10.10.1 could be written as 1010. Now it has to be 8 bits, right? So I can add zeros in the middle. It does not change the value by the way. So 10 dot 10 dot ten dot and the last is one. Decimal one as a binary value of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And th this is the given IP address, right? This is what is assigned for this PC. Now, this is dot 2, which will make it like 1, 0 here, and dot 5, which will make the last three bits feel like 1, 0, 1. Right? We're not getting into that at the moment, but I just want to say, okay, uh, if you want, I could write it as well 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, dot. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Let me write the binary for 5, 10.10.10.5. So it is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. That is 10.10.10.5. Now, as per the given IP address and subnet mask, subnet mask is what defines in the given IP address how many bits are network bits and how many are host bits. So in this given IP address, uh, it's slash 24, which means the first 24 bits, the first 24 bits are network bits. Now, if you look at it, 10.10.10.1 10 slash 24 and 10.10.10.5 slash 24, in both these cases, the first 24 bits are same. Take this example, right? first 24 bits are same. What it means is they both belong to the same network. 
right? Where the network IDs are same, they belong to the same network. Host ID has to be different. No two devices on any given network should have same host ID because host ID is what will uniquely ident identify it, right, in the network. So which in this case it very well does. So this is point 10.10.10.1. This is 10.10.10.2. This is 10.10.10.5. So they all belong to the same network, but they have a different host ID. Okay, so why did we speak about all of this? So assigning an IP address like this, a dotted decimal format, this is part of IP version 4. So logical addressing is being dealt with at layer 3. Right? Along with that, uh, path determination like say for example if you take a router right the router's job is to connect more than one networks so on one interface of router it will connect to one network say for example in this case our network is 10.10.10 right now how do you represent a network address this is what a, a ip address of a host look like so 10.10.10.1 the host ip address of pc1 10.10.10.2 is host IP address of PC2 and 10.10.10.5 is host IP address of PC3. But how do you summarize it? How do you say about, uh, how, how do you define the network address which defines all of these? It's by specifying all the host bits to zero. That's how you mention a network address. So 10.10.10.0 slash 24. Uh, from this we know that the first 24 bits are network ID and the last part is host ID. So if all host bits are zero, it means it is network address. It represents the entire network. So if you take a typical router, it would connect one network like this to another network which could be say 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Right? Again. So that's what a router is supposed to do. So uh, that's the reason, key reason um, why we say a router to be an L3 device. Its job is to connect one network to another. It will also help determine the route to across multiple networks. So if you have a device, we were earlier discussing about uh, your PC where you would have opened the browser, you type in say flip.diasnetworks.com from your PC being connected to another router at your premise. From there it goes to the internet service provider's router. From there it goes to another router, it goes to a backbone network, right? It's, it's, it would ideally be an internet van cloud and finally reaching out to uh, the web server kept somewhere remotely. So in this case, how does a router know where to carry the traffic to? Because this is not the only set of routers that would be connected. There would be a whole lot of devices, whole network, or it can be, it'll be a mesh of net devices, right? Full mesh or partial mesh, whatever the case be. So there would be a, a series of routers connected. So how would uh, the router know where to carry traffic to so that it finally ends up into the web server. So it needs to know the root, right? Root R O U T E root. So how does it know about the root? By looking into the routing table. So every router maintains a routing table, right? It needs to have the routing information to route the traffic to the proper destination. So uh, the path determination and the logical addressing, all of these are basically functionalities of network layer or layer 3. Right? So, with that, for the moment, we'll go back and see what happens at layer 2. So, now that we understand, okay, at layer 3, it's about path determination and logical addressing, data link layer is all about uh doing stuff like media access and then flow control error control and physical address now you could also have uh, like compression and 
authentication handled depending on the kind of media you are connected to. Now the media access, now say for if, if it is Ethernet, wired connection, you would be going with CSMA bar C, D, wireless will have CSMA bars A uh, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, the protocol that would, uh, you should immediately think of is like Ethernet. Ethernet is a layer 2 protocol in conjunction with uh, layer 1 depending on what is being used as the underlying uh, physical media. So if you are using a serial point to point link, like especially the ones used to connect uh, WAN routers, in this case the layer 2 protocol that would be running uh, would not be Ethernet, it could be like HDLC or point to point high level data link control or point to point protocol and so forth. And uh, yeah, protocols like point to point protocol also allows you to do authentication, you know, between the routers for the communication to happen. Layer two. Most importantly, what we should know at uh, data link layer, what happens is, uh, say, let's take the example of Ethernet. Uh, you need to deal with physical addressing or MAC addressing. So MAC address is a 48-bit address that is burnt into the card. What I mean is uh, any device manufacturer or the uh, network interface card manufacturer, popularly known as NIC, network interface card, right? So in the network interface card, you will have, say, multiple ports. Uh, generally for PC uh, or the laptop, you would have one port where you can connect the RJ45 jack. Registered Jack 45. So uh, against this port, there would be a defined MAC address. Uh, it will be fixed in status. It, it, it's a standard 48-bit value, and it's uh, this 48-bit is such that it, it has a part of it. The first 24 bits called OUI, organizationally unique identifier, and the last four, uh, 24, so 24 and 24 making up 48, right? So last 24 uh, being interface identifier. So it, it's basically to identify uh, the interface that, and, and, and this is something configured by uh, the vendor, the manufacturer who is making the card. So if Cisco is manufacturing the card, they will have their own unique OUI or series of OUIs that would be assigned or registered uh, through standard bodies. So Cisco would have their own HP, if they are manufacturing the card, they would have their own and so forth. So that's what identifies them and make sure, makes sure that no two uh, MAC addresses have conflict when they communicate over a local area network, right? So the layer two, that is the data link layer, it deals with, it, it has to actually uh, deal with physical addressing and all of this stuff as mentioned here media access flow controller controller and so forth right. and Yeah And it does all of these uh, I mean as the physical addressing with the help of Mac address Which will de deal with practically we'll see how to determine how to see what is the Mac address of our uh, PC how to check that right we'll go through that at a later point on time but for now just understand that every device that communicate on a network they would have a, a physical address associated with them which is not supposed to be tampered or altered it's rather burnt into the uh, device by the equipment manufacturer and then comes the physical layer where at physical layer or the layer one uh, we deal with the media signaling and the binary transmissions. So the media being wired or wireless, or if it is wired, you know, it could be copper. So if it is copper, you would have the signal in the format of, um, you know, voltage signals, plus minus. Or if it is uh, optical fiber media, then uh, your signal would be uh, optical waves or 
that's light rays basically and uh, if yours is a you know your media is a wireless medium then your signal would be you know uh, wireless frequency encoded frequency right that could be received like we, we had discussed about various channels uh, when we were discussing uh, about access points so we said like you could have transmission at 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz depending on the standard that you're using and so forth so basically you are dealing with the media the signaling and the binary transmission that's what happens at physical layer